Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to call the meeting to order. This is the um, uh, business portion from 3.30 to 4. And before we do anything, I want to introduce Andrea. She's our language justice person for today. Andrea, I know that you're signed on. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrea. I'm here with the Community Language Cooperative. Thank you so much for having me in this space so that we can practice language justice. We're going to ensure that everybody can speak and hear in the language of their heart or how they feel more comfortable speaking. We're going to have simultaneous interpretation using the tool that Zoom provides so that we can have English and Spanish languages available. Once we turn on the interpretation, after I'm done saying this message in Spanish, you're going to see a globe that is going to come up on the bottom of your screen. And there you're gonna be able to click it and select your language. If you are fully bilingual in English and in Spanish, you don't have to select any language, but if not, we recommend that you do so, so that you can fully participate of this meeting. I do remind everybody to speak at a conversational pace, stretch your words, Spanish is 25% longer than English, so it takes me longer to say everything in the other language. And if at some point you're speaking too quickly and I need you to slow down, I'm going to turn on my camera and I'm going to make this sign. It just means stretch your words so that I can catch up. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Andrea, estoy aquí con la Community Language Cooperative. Muchas gracias por permitirme estar en este espacio donde podemos practicar la justicia del lenguaje. Vamos a tener interpretación simultánea en inglés y en español utilizando la herramienta de Zoom y vamos a poder seleccionar nuestro idioma preferido haciéndole clic al globo terráqueo que va a salir en la parte de abajo de tu pantalla y ahí puedes seleccionar inglés o español. Si eres totalmente bilingüe en esos dos idiomas no tienes que escoger ninguno, pero si no te recomendamos que escojas tu idioma preferido para que puedas participar en totalidad de esta reunión. Recuerden hablar a un paso conversacional, mantenerse en silencio cuando no estén hablando y hablar muy cerquita a su micrófono cuando sea su turno de hablar. Please remember to remain muted when you're not speaking and speak very close to your microphone when it's your turn to speak. And we can begin interpretation now. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, did everybody find their little globe? Okay. Um, we have got the Communities That Care folks here today. We're real excited to get an update from them. And Sasha, we're just gonna go ahead and call on you first because I know you're online. There you are. Why don't you go ahead and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. Beautiful. Is everybody able to see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank so. you. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sasha Hutchings. I use she, her pronouns, and I have the honor of being the executive director of Jefferson County Communities That Care. Um, we very much appreciate the opportunity to meet with you this afternoon um, to give you a brief update on the coalition's transition as well as our future plans. Um, due to the short time that we have here today, I will be presenting the bulk of this study session um, with you, but I wanted to acknowledge that we have other members of the coalition here today, um, and they are, will also be available to, to answer questions, um, as I will touch on um, in a bit. I am uh, new to the coalition, so there might be folks who might have uh, better answers than I, than I could potentially give. Um, Emily Merriweather is Jeffco CTC's coordinator. Um, Dave Kohler and Debbie Bauer are Jeffco CTC's Executive Committee co-chairs. Um, there are also other members of Jeffco CTC's Executive Committee that are in attendance this afternoon. Um, and in addition to that, um, we are very lucky that we have some youth representatives with us today who you will be hearing from in a bit. So we have um, Abiona, Kay, and Peyton. Um, and I am so grateful that you are all able to, to join us here, here today. Um, we will have some time at the end of the study session for questions, but please do not hesitate to ask questions throughout. Um, I definitely want this to be much more of a conversation than, than a lecture, um, and I want to make sure to touch on um, any um, uh, issues or questions that you might that you might have. So please do not do not um, hesitate. 
Um, so as you know, um, the coalition has been working very hard for many months to transition to become a project of the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center or CNDC. We are pleased to let you know that Jeffco CTC officially became a partner project of CNBC on January 1st, 2023. Uh, the past few months, we have been working with CD CNDC to learn about their um, policies and procedures and how we fit into those, as well as determining the next best steps for the coalition. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for everyone at JCPH um, and all of the help that, that we were given as uh, we made this transition and that folks who allowed this transition to be possible. Um, I cannot name everyone who has helped with the transition, although I would like to, um, but I would like to specifically thank Kelly Cast for all of her assistance throughout this process. Um, she has been absolutely incredible, and, and I think I'm uh, speaking for everyone that I don't know that we would be here um, if, it, if it wasn't for her assistance, so I thank you to her. Um, as I mentioned, I am the new executive director of Jeffco CTC, um, as I had the privilege of joining the team in February. I am tremendously grateful for the warm welcome I have received, as well as the time and energy so many folks from within the coalition have given me um, during my um, onboarding. A uh, little bit about me. My background is in nonprofit management. I have worked extensively with marginalized communities, survivors of interpersonal violence, and disenfranchised youth and their families. Throughout my work, I've always strived to empower and give voice to those who are so often silenced. Um, and I have uh, experience working with various coalitions and collaborations, and I'm very excited um, as we begin to look at the um, future and the, the potential for Jeffco CTC. Um, as you likely know, I know we've given uh, updates in the past, our tr transition has not been without some challenges. Uh, due to some circumstances beyond our control, um, we had to get a new domain for our website. Um, however, we are using this opportunity, make uh, lemonade out of lemons, right, uh, to redesign our website to ensure that it is fully accessible and user friendly. We'll be having a relaunch of our new website, which will be jeffcoctc.care soon, so please stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, you can still get access to our previous website, um, although the domain doesn't work. If you um, Google Jeffco CTC, it will come up and you can still get access to that. There's an amazing amount of fantastic information on our website, so you can still have access to that. Throughout our transition, um, we have been working with our funders uh, to determine the best path forward, recognizing the need to update our fiscal agent for, for each of our grants. It was determined that our health disparities and communities grant program funding, which is through CDPHE, would remain at JCPH as the funding was not able to be transferred to a new fiscal agent. We've been working in a great partnership with JCPH on the Out for Safe Spaces, Building Allyship and Diversity in Jeffco, or BADGE, initiative that has been funded by this grant. Um, I'll discuss the BADGE initiative in more detail in a bit. Our Communities Organizing for Prevention Grant, also through CDPAG, was transferred to CNDC and funds were available as of January 1st, 2023. We find ourselves needing to spend the full grant in a very shortened amount of time due to the transition, as well as the grant period ending June 30th, 2023. We've been able to identify ways to spend the funding that will, that will benefit the coalition long-term. For example, the website redesign I mentioned previously um, is uh, made possible due to the, the funding that we have available. We are also um, uh, holding a DEI workshop series for our coalition members that will um, uh, kind of root the, the work that the coalition does moving forward in, uh, in a DEI, DEI lens. Our CDC Drug-Free Communities Grant took some time to sort out. The grant was officially re-obligated and funds were available as of the end of April, so just a couple of weeks ago. This process and the delay in getting access to these funds have proved to be a bit challenging. Um, however, we are very grateful um, to the work that um, CDC uh, working with us and being committed to, to make it happen. Um, and we're uh, very glad that it is now um, officially 
um, CNDC listed as the fiscal agent and we were able to move forward with that funding. Um, in addition, the coalition has been very fortunate to have the support of the Community First Foundation throughout this process. The, funded, the foundation gave Jeffco CTC an initial grant of $100,000 to assist the organization in the transition over to CNDC. Then after it was determined that the coalition may have cash flow issue due to the delay in receiving the DFC funding that I mentioned previously, as well as the need to spend down the COFP grant quickly, the Community First Foundation granted uh, Jeffco CTC an additional $60,000 to help with our working capital, as well as to then establish an ongoing reserve fund for the organization. This funding will allow Jeffco CTC to build a stable and sustainable base from which we can grow. Throughout the transition, Jeffco CTC and JCPH have continued to build our partnership. Multiple JCPH employees have been involved in Jeffco CTC initiatives, including our youth town hall, our workshops, Jeffco CTC workshops, and through the badge initiative I mentioned previously. In fact, two JCPH employees are members of Jeffco CTC Executive Committee, Debbie Bauer and Kelly Curl, and we're so grateful to have the continued partnership of JCPH. We look forward as we continue um, as we continue to move forward, we look forward to finding new ways that we can that the organizations can continue to work together. A few highlights that I wanted to, to point out, um, and I'm noticing my apologies, apparently I hit the I was too quick on the uh, slides, so we've been on the highlights for a while. So you'll just get to know the highlights really well, which is a great thing. This is the most important part of what we're doing, right? Um, as we look to the future, we are um, so excited for the, the possibilities that are before us. We are gearing up to begin a strategic planning process in August, where we will identify the coalition's priorities for the next three to five years. We are also very excited to be working with the consultant regarding the coalition's youth engagement. Specifically, we're reviewing our youth intern program. And Celicia Lopez comes to us um, having worked with Denver Public Schools as the Director of Student Voice and Leadership. So we are very excited to have her assistance as we, as we move through, through this process. Um, we are going to be working with her in an effort to build a stronger pro program and more authentic engagement with youth as we move forward. We're see seeking feedback from youth, from our community partners, and for other from of any others who have been involved with Jeffco CTC and our youth intern program historically. We plan to relaunch the youth internship program this fall, and it will be rooted in the feedback as well as the recommendations that we have received through this review process. In addition, we hope to hire a new youth engagement coordinator. Um, in the near future to continue this work specifically around our, our uh, youth engagement and youth intern program. Uh, as I explained previously, um, we are extremely excited about Jeffco CTC's Out for Safe Spaces badge initiative. The badge initiative is a great example of the partnership between Jeffco CTC and JCPH. Out for Safe Spaces is a national initiative that supports adults who work with youth so they may be visibly identified as trusted adults to LGBTQ+, BIPOC, and multiracial youth. Staff from the organizations who are participating in our badge program will receive training in building affirming environments for LGBTQ+, BIPOC, and multiracial youth. Upon completing these trainings, the participants will receive an actual badge that signify they are prepared to work and support youth as an ally. Out for Safe Spaces is based on the successful Out for Safe Schools initiative that you might you may have heard of. And both of these initiatives um, are run by the LA LGBT, LGBT Center, one of our partners on this project. Uh, we are just finishing the badge pilot program in which three part of our partner organizations, the Jefferson Center, Jefferson County Open Space, and Jefferson County Human Services have participated in five trainings in order to receive their badges. Um, we And we are um, extremely thrilled to be able to share with you that we have recently um, learned that we received a no cost extension for this program so that we will have funding for this program another year. Uh, moving forward, we're going to be looking at uh, feedback from our partner um, 
uh, organizations who are part of the pilot program evaluation of the program as well as sustainability for the program through this summer and into this fall. While we've had to pause much of our programming during, during the transition the past few months, we have been lucky to work with a group of youth on Jeffco CTC's annual Youth Town Hall, which was held at the end of Feb February, as well as to plan some upcoming Community Pride Month events. We wanted to take some time this afternoon to allow you to hear directly from a few of the youth who've been involved in the planning group. We met with them last week and asked them to reflect on two questions. The first question we will hear from Abiona, reflecting on what did you find valuable in participating in the youth town hall planning process? Abiona, I will pass it to you. Hi, I'm Abiona. I'm part of the youth town hall uh, youth voices group. So uh, when we were asked this question, we put a strong value on community. Um, and community within each other and within the youth leaders themselves and also with the adults that were there with us. Um, we found it particularly helpful that we were valued and we were understood. We felt like everyone there really wanted to know what we wanted to do and were really interested in our ideas and our feelings. Um, we knew that we were doing something positive and that would have an effect on our community and would push our community forward um, and really help those in need in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, we had very supportive adults such as Debbie, Sasha, Emily, they were all very kind and they helped us move our project forward and very much gave us helpful hints when we were struggling or helped us improve our ideas or really power through our ideas and make them a reality. So having an hour and a half every week where we knew uh, we would be listened to and accepted and uh, supported was really helpful and great um, for the community and for us and it really helped us express ourselves more within these meetings. Um, we were not seen as anything other than humans and we were very much taken very seriously in the eyes of adults, which was something that was very empowering for all of us. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Aviona, I appreciate you. Um, next, we are going to hear from Peyton, who will be reflecting on the question, what would you like to see for the Youth Town Hall in the future? Peyton? Yeah, so hi, I'm Peyton. Um, we, uh, when we were talking about this, talked about uh, just things like um a lot of it was focused on having more people be involved and just be having a wider reach on to more people to be involved in the planning group and in the actual town hall itself and we were also talking about doing some things in person we thought that would be pretty meaningful and significant we talked about extending outside of schools just because it's difficult to connect with people who are homeschooled and go to charter or private schools. And then uh, having more adults involved. I know that having teachers has been a pretty big thing in the past and just teachers, counselors, school representatives and stuff. And yeah, that was kind of our main focus is just how many people are involved. Wonderful, thank you, Peyton. And my apologies, my cat was trying to get on my computer so I did not advance the slide for you in a timely manner. So my apologies to you, Peyton, <laughs> not my intention at all. Um, finally, um, I wanted to share that as we were talking about presenting at the study session um, at our meeting last week, um, the conversation turned to creating a word cloud um, to kind of express uh, what the experience was. So I'm going to pass it over to Kay to explain um, both the word cloud and how, how it came to be. Kay? 
Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Kay. I use they, them, theirs pronouns. We last week had kind of discussed um, this question about like what we love about the badge youth planning team. And I thought it would be a cool idea to put together all of these words that represent who the badge youth planning team is. So we kind of went through, there was only a few youth on this meeting, but we were able to kind of get a general consensus from all the adults and all the kids on the meeting about how we felt it was. One of the big words, and this has come up before, is community, support, welcoming, listening, teamwork, good vibes is always true. Um, the acceptingness, the engagement from the youth planners and the adult planners, um, the learning, the being able to have your voice and speak what you want to say and have people listen to you when you want to say it. Um, having the impressive part of it where you have all of these people from different schools who have never met in person, um, talking to each other through a screen, planning big events that not only change our lives, but everybody else's lives around us. Um, it gives us hope. It gives kindness when it when things are sad, um, collaboration. There's a lot of collaboration between local nonprofits and um, other big organizations like CTC and Jeffco Public Libraries and things along those lines. So we just kind of put all these words together and made it what we wanted to represent. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Kay. Appreciate you. Um, I am extremely honored to be working with these absolutely lovely humans um, that you got to meet today, as well as our full coalition is just amazing, amazing people. Um, and I very much appreciate having the opportunity to tell you a little bit about um, kind of how, how, where we are and the, the amazing work that's, that's being done. Um, with that, wanted to leave again, as I mentioned previously, some time for if there are questions from from you all that we can answer. Um, and again, we do have um, multiple folks who are um, with the coalition here. So if if I do not have the answer, I'm sure we have somebody who here who could who could answer any questions that you may have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen just so I can see see everyone's faces. And I don't have a specific question yet. Um, but I do want to say how excited I am to see all of this. And I have to tell all of you, um, our great youth here, you're about, you have no idea how valuable your voices are. Um, I always say, if you want to know what, what's going on with you, go ask them. They will be happy to tell you. And so um, thank you. Thank you for the work that you put into this. It's more than valuable. And I love that you're having the town hall meetings. Questions, comments from the board? Wayne? Yeah, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, I very much appreciate it. This has been a, an incredibly important program. And I think, I guess the question I have is, as the board is going to be meeting this summer, thinking about our strategic vision and direction and building out strategic plans, We'd still love to get insight from the group on where are the kind of major focus areas that you feel uh, public health needs to be more focused. So um, as you're certainly engaging your peers, I would love to see this expanded. I know that you're in several schools, but there's a lot of schools that there isn't programs like this. Um, there aren't those youth leaders. So that to me is certainly one thing I would love to see more engagement across all of the school districts. Um, but anyway, just would love to get those thoughts. And it doesn't have to be immediately right now, but just know that it's an open invitation to please send us your thoughts on the strategic direction. But if you have something now, I'd love to hear it. Um, for me, I think there should be a focus on violence and um, drug use. And I know that that's kind of what we our uh, quick town hall um, where we focus on kind of the drug use in youth. Um, and I think especially now with all of the violence that is occurring and how both um, those link, I think it is very important to uh, spend resources and time and effort into things like that. 
I can agree with that. Um, one thing that I kind of think of when I think of like coming together is making safe spaces. And we've talked about this a lot with our youth planning, like creating areas and creating time where we can have safe spots for kids to come work on homework, talk to counselors, or even have fun and play games with their friends and maybe building it into a period at school or engaging people who want to have that at their school, bringing that into their school and helping them build it from square zero. There are comments and questions from the board members? I, I do, up. Cherry. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I just want to also congratulate you guys for being able to advance so much this program. I, I know it has been some struggles, and I'm so impressed that you guys are keeping up and keep it going. I'm really happy to hear some of the projects and updates that you have. My question is, um, I know there are some um, schools that are struggling, uh, especially in Jeffco after all the closings and parents having difficulty um, kind of getting their kids to the schools and transportation is an issue. And also um, they lost a lot of extracurriculum programs. My question is, how are you reaching now to those schools that are underfunded and they don't have access to those extra curriculum activities to keep their 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 kids at any age healthy and informed and taking care, especially uh, when parents have to work so many hours. Does somebody want to take that question? I could try to struggle through an answer of that. Uh, you know. I don't know if that's necessarily been the focus of our CTC work to this point. Um, I think you raise a really um, important um, area for us to look at as we get together and do strategic planning this summer. Um, I think where we would, would have captured maybe some of that thinking and that need is in our efforts to reach certainly our, our underserved populations where, you know, which were overly impacted by many of those school consolidations. Um, but we don't right now have a specific strategy that was focused in in those particular areas. Um, I, I totally expect that that will come up though as we, you know, jump into our strategic planning process this summer. And I'm I'm really glad you raised that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David. Yeah. Thank you, David. And I'm uh, looking forward to see what you guys uh, came up with, and be happy to um, collaborate in any way. Harriet, if I could just. Um... Um, echo the congratulations and thank you all for coming to speak with us um, and for caring um, and the work that you do um, because of that. Um, and I want to echo what Lane said um, in terms of um, hoping that you will be thinking about what should public health be focused on um, from the perspective of what youth need um, and let us know. Um, and if you can't figure out how to let us know why, I'm sure Sasha can. So um, again, um, thank you. And also welcome Sasha. Um, so I feel really pleased that CTC has successfully made this transition and um, is continuing. And it sounds like it's continuing strongly. So that's really good. Thank you. It is such I an just, important uh, program. Oh I'm, sorry. oh, I'm sorry, David, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I was just gonna say, I, I think, you know, the, the piece that's really important, I know Sasha talked about it in her presentation, is just the continued partnership. Um, I know we have, you know, a number of staff from the, the health department who are, you know, constant contributing, fantastic members. Um, but just as as you think about what that looks like moving forward, just know that that we see the partnership and, and the participation is integral to the success of our CTC programming. And, and just hope that as you think about your resources, I know the human resources, the, the number one you know, thing we always think about as we have those processes, know that we find great value in the staff you have participating in CTC. Thank you. Um, you know, the other thing that I would say is I think it would be valuable, well, I can speak for myself and I know my colleagues pretty well and they're all very um, impressed by what you all do, but I think it would be great if we just even some of the, the youth 
even the three of you that are here or um, whoever wants to join us to go have coffee and just sit down and really kind of look, what should this look like? What public health should look like? I think that Lane brings up an excellent point. Um, and I think having kind of a, a group or, you know, whatever, get together to see what your thoughts are. So we would love to have you all reach out. Sasha will put that on your to-do list and you can get my contact information and then we'll put it on our to-do list. Of course, Lindsay's gonna have to do it all because <laughs> Lindsay keeps us together. Any other comments from the board members? Oh, Debbie, you have your hand up. Debbie Bauer. Hello, just a, a quick comment. I know that we're nearing the end of our time, but it is wonderful. Thank you so much, Kay, Peyton, Nabiona, for being here and for being so involved for all these months and all the months to come, because I know that you are truly committed and just absolutely gems in um, all of your endeavors, all your, your schools, and, and certainly with us and in the community at large. There are so many ways, and this, this partnership is such a rich one between JCPH, the school district, CTC, all the different partners. Uh, Peyton touched on it a bit specifically in her comments that there's a strong vibrancy and commitment to youth and their well-being and their active involvement and voice in, in having a say and participation and engagement and, and power in in being a part of the processes that affect their lives. So thank you to the board. Thank you to the youth and onward with fantastic partnership partnership among us and in ever widening concentric circles in the community. Okay, are there further comments or questions from the board members? I am not seeing any. Well, thank you all for taking time. It's really important that we hear from you. We're really happy to see the directions that you're going and um, the fabulous work that you're continuing to do. And we are very happy to see it moving in the great direction it is. So thank you. Thank you so much. We're happy happy to be here and happy to have any conversations moving forward as well. It'd be amazing. We appreciate your partnership and so much. Thank you, Sasha. Okay. With that, we will conclude our business meeting. It is 4.02 and we will go right into our um, actual business meeting. Excuse me, that was our presentation meeting. So the business meeting will start at 4.02. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is ask for a roll call. Lindsay? Rochelle Woods. Present. Hilda Gerke. Present. Harriet Hall. Present. Lane Drager. Present. And Sherry Zahn. Present. For the record, a quorum has been established. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, we have got a consent agenda. Uh, the acceptance of the agenda, approval of April board and of health meeting minutes, approval of the warrants and approval of the contracts. Um, those are all under their consent. Is there anything that someone feels that they would like to discuss that needs to be removed? If not, may I get a motion for the approval of the consent calendar? I move that we um, accept the uh, consent agenda um, and the items on it. I second. Okay, we have a motion and we do have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. And uh, we have got the um, public comment, but Lindsay, I forgot to ask my deepest apologies. I'm not sure that we have anyone signed up. You are correct. No one signed okay. up. All right, thank you. We will move right on to the financial report. Um, and ask Joe to present, and then Lane's going to make a motion to approve. <laughs> We're going to vote. Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. Bear with me one second. Here we go. Please let me know if you are unable to see the um, April, April year-to-date financial statements. Uh, hopefully, this is the a size that everyone can, um, can see pretty clearly. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were uh, presenting the April year to debt financial statement. I will be April financial statements. I'll be primarily focused on this column here, not so much on the transaction specific for the month of April, but the year to date actuals. 
Through the month of April, our grant funding is roughly about $4.2 million, which represents about 33% of our annual budget. We have recorded charges for services at $1.3 million, which is about 49% of our budget. Uh, please keep in mind that through the month of April, we are at 33%, we are 33% through this fiscal year. So we are indeed on target with our grant funding at 33%, we've um, reached, uh, realized 33% of our grant funding. We are ahead of budget with our charges for services as we typically have a, um, as we typically recognize a larger portion of that in the beginning of the uh, beginning of the year. So it is uh, pretty typical to be ahead of schedule through the uh, first half of the fiscal year. Uh, investments, this, these are transactions reported at the, at the county level. Uh, we typically don't budget for these items uh, for investments because we don't have control over these investment mechanisms. So um, realistically, 21,000 year to date is pretty high for a fiscal year. So um, I'm pleasantly surprised by having this amount of funding. Um, but again, um, we don't typically um, spend much, um, much efforts on budgeting as we are not in control of these investment mechanisms. Moving down to our expenditures, uh, so sorry, so this puts us at roughly about $5.6 million for the fiscal year for total revenues, roughly about 36% of our annual budget. So again, ahead of schedule at this point. Moving down to our expenditure uh, categories, we're looking at salaries and benefits of roughly about $5.2 million, which represents about 29% of our um, annual budget. We are a little behind on our budget, which uh, realizes some of that, some of those savings with vacancies, turnover, refilling positions, things along those lines. We also um, have to include the, um, the, the two months of the fiscal year that have additional payrolls. So although it looks as though we are significantly below budget, um, at 29%, being 33% through the fiscal year, um, we anticipate catching up for some of that, as well as some of those vacancies, as I already mentioned. So um, nothing to be too concerned with. Um, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that we are in line with our budget at this point of the fiscal year. Supplies, this is a tricky line, and this really reflects some of the difficulties with developing a fiscal year budget. Um, so early in a, in the previous year, as you can see, this this fiscal budget was developed in the middle of 2022, so last year. So um, our annual budget for supplies is about $120,000. We've already recognized about $98,000. Um, reflecting on our budget from last year, there was a much larger um, variance between these two numbers. So. We're, we're moving closer to aligning with the supply budget that we need for the department, but of course there are many, many variables with the many, many grants that we manage throughout the fiscal year. So this is one of those moving targets, and like I mentioned, this is, this is the difficulty with developing a budget, but uh, um, nothing to be concerned with as this is a small fraction of our overall budget, our $24 million budget. Um, we were only at $120,000 for supplies, but um, I do anticipate going over that, uh, that, that figure pretty soon, but again, not of, not of large concern for the, um, for the annual budget. Other services and charges, we are roughly about $850,000 on a $3 million budget, so 29%, a little bit under budget. These other categories, there's not much to really reflect on um, other than uh, bringing attention to this interdepartmental um, line. This essentially is services that we that are provided at the county level, um, various other departments, um, resources that public health relies on at the county level. Um, I, this, this figure really is, um, is guided by the county, um, the, the county offices, the county budget office. Um, somewhat out of our control. We have little impact on how that is reflected on our budget, but um, we are indeed um, in line and on target with that. In previous reporting periods, in the previous months, there was a lag as the county um, did not post those transactions in time to be reflected on the Board of Health's uh, presentation, but it looks like we are indeed back on track realizing 34% of the annual budget of $2.5 million, we have received, uh, we've, we've recognized about $850,000. What that results in is a, um, a um, is expenditures exceeding revenue that we've, that we've recognized of roughly about $1.6 million. This essentially represents the county support, the county general funds that the public, that public health does indeed receive on an annual basis. At this point through this fiscal year, we've realized about 
of the county funds that has been allocated to public health uh, for the year is $8.7 million. Again, we've recognized about $1.6 million. So we we still are in a good financial situation. I think that we, we need to continue to plan ahead and ensure that we close up some of those gaps and ensure that we utilize the full extent of the, the county funds that is available for public health, as well as realizing all of our grant revenue and some of those other budgeted revenue items. So at this point, I think that we are still in line with um, a strong fiscal year and um, still a lot of opportunities left for the, the health for JCPH. That's all I have, unless there's any questions. Um, I'd like to address them at this time, if there are any. Are there questions for Joe? No? Okay. Lane? I will move to approve the financial statement. May we get a second? We'll second. And that has been seconded by Harriet. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. Okay, we will go right into the old business. And I do believe um, we're going to go through the executive um, director hiring process update. And Daniel, I believe you're on the line. I am, in fact, there Madam Chair, not, uh, not by camera, but uh, here to listen in and pleased to give you all an update. We're continuing um, with our candidate uh, sourcing efforts, trying to identify candidates. I have an interview tomorrow. Um, I'm pleased to say I think a few more will follow. So we've got what I hope to be some promising candidates in the pipeline and certainly encourage, just as Lane has done, any of you that have your recommendations to continue to forward those to us and we'll dutifully reach out to those folks and discern whether they have an interest level or not. So um, I'm happy to entertain any questions anybody has at this time. Thank you. Do we have questions for Daniel on how the process is going, Lane? Um, I don't know, maybe this isn't for Dan, but I guess thinking about being prepared for candidates, you know, the, us having some time blocked out. So just uh, making sure we have that good communication that as soon as you have some folks that you think the board should look at, um, that we have time blocked out to do that. So um, just let us know, Dan, in advance when we should be starting to, to build time in our calendars for that. Great point, Lane, and I, uh... I'll certainly keep you posted. Um, I don't have anybody there right now, but that could change with tomorrow's interview or others I hope will soon follow. So I'll uh, I'll be in touch with Lindsay and she can ping all of you and we can start working on time. So appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate that very much. The board has been- Appreciate your, appreciate your patience with this process. So. <laughs> It is always a process. I have actually talked to a couple of other uh, folks that are in the public um, health sector, and they all seem to be having the same same um, issue, I guess, that it's you know a little difficult out there right now. Hilda, I think you have a question. Uh, yeah, just wondering if uh, Daniel could give us an update of how many has he interviewed so far after, I mean, from the second phase, if we want to call it that way. I am happy to, Hilda. I, I can't quote chapter and verse on how many I had interviewed up until the time we kind of restarted the search, but I have interviewed four since that time, um, and tomorrow's will be a fifth, and then I've got, uh, uh, again, at least what I hope will be three more to interview, so, and I'm hoping out of all those, um, tomorrow's uh, right now. I don't have anybody that I would uh, move uh, for the board to consider at this point in time, but I'm hopeful that will soon change. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you're, you. You're welcome. Good question. Are there any further comments, questions for Daniel? Okay, we do want to have a legislative update. Kelly Curl, I think you're on the line. Yep, let me get. Yep, there she is. Up here. Because I always have to relearn how to do this. Hmm. 
All right, is that showing the notes or the full slide? It's got the notes. Mm. Whoops. I think I got it. There, did that work? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Sweet. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's great to see you all again. Thank you for giving me a few more minutes for one final update. Um, they did squeeze in some new bills between our last update and now, so I'll share those with you. And I've got a few updates on some bills that we looked at before. Um, and just so that you all know, I am working on kind of a comprehensive public health legislative recap report type product um, that once that's ready, I will make sure that that gets your way so that you kind of have it all together in one place. Um, but I'll cover a few things that happened since our last update. Um, looking at our public health infrastructure functions and workforce related bills, um, House Bill 23 1300 was a joint budget committee bill that directs the healthcare uh, policy and financing department at the state level to seek federal authorization to get a couple of target groups um, continuous Medicaid eligibility. They're looking for um, kiddos who are ages zero to three to be able to be continuously eligible for Medicaid throughout that um, age span. And then they're also looking to make folks that are adults who are coming out of um, correctional facilities continuously eligible for 12 months after their release back into our communities as a means to help them integrate more effectively back um, into our communities. So that bill was introduced and passed in the time since our last update. Um, Senate Bill 260 around um, increasing access and reducing barriers to publicly funded vaccines um, also went through before the end of session. And Senate Bill 284 um, is a bill around contraceptive access that was introduced fairly recently and moved through the process quickly. Um, and this does a few kind of logistical cleanup items to help make sure that some prior legislative work to help folks get a 12 month supply of contraception actually can do so. Um, and have their insurance cover the cost of getting that year supply up front so that they don't have any disruption to their birth control use. For bills that connect to some of our programs and our services and things that we're focused on, um, House Bill 1244, which is a bill that changes some of the structure at the state level of a regional health connector program and increases the funding and continues that funding on an ongoing basis for that program, um, did move through the process and was passed. And it should be sent to Governor Polis soon for his signature. Um, and then Senate Bill 288 um, was a bill introduced pretty late in session. And this is around um, providing some coverage for costs to have doula services um, provided for folks. Um, certainly maternal health um, is a, a huge focus area for JCPH. Um, and we're aware that um, the services doula provide have a lot of really important equity components as well. And Harriet, I see your hand too. Yeah, I'm just I'm just hoping that you'll mention um, if any of these um, have been already signed by the governor and if any of them might be not signed um, or vetoed by the governor, are any of them at risk? <clears throat> I, of the ones I have in my update today, I haven't heard a lot of specifics about ones that I know for sure are at risk. Um, and they all are kind of in various stages of the process of rounding out now that session ended last week to being sent. So some of them are getting finalized now, it seems like, to be sent to him for signature. Some of them have been sent but not signed yet. Um, so I don't have that level of detail available to me right now, but if there's any in particular that you're looking for before I can get that kind of comprehensive update to you, let me know and I can get that info to you. Okay, there's no particular one. I just I just know that I you know keep hearing about um, this bill was signed and this bill wasn't signed and stuff like that. So yeah. that's I think he'll be last hurdle. <laughs> yes, yes. It was, legislative session is over, but not quite. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's right. As many of them are waiting for him. I, I want to say that he's got through, I think, the seventh I saw on a recent update to take action or decide not to take action on, on bills that are headed to him. So yeah, session officially ended, but not quite practical <laughs> in practicality <laughs> terms. Um, and then I wanted to spend a minute on our behavioral health and substance use bills. I know that behavioral health and substance use is certainly front of mind for a lot of the work that we're doing and for our communities as well. Um, House Bill 1003 is one that we looked at 
way back early in session um, around expanding access to mental health screenings in public schools for older kiddos ages or well, grades six through 12. Um, that bill was amended a fair bit through the process, but did ultimately pass um, and is going forward. Um, House Bill 1167 around reporting emergency overdose events is a Good Samaritan type bill that helps folks um, have more comfort and ability to seek emergency services for somebody experiencing an overdose if they themselves are using substances that are not legal. It reduces some of the criminal pen penalties that might be um, impacting them currently. So this bill helps um, make that a little bit safer and hopefully gets folks who might be experiencing overdose connection to help when they need it. The House Bill 1202 around overdose prevention centers uh, ultimately passed the House but did not make it out of the Senate. So that bill is not going forward. I have not yet heard if there's gonna be future work or efforts around this. I would imagine there will be, though I don't know what that would look like yet. Um, the state law was kind of the last hurdle keeping Denver's plans from moving forward. They've had some plans in the works for a long time to try and open one of these centers. Um, so I imagine that they're trying to re-strategize and figure out how to move forward now that this bill um, for this session isn't going anywhere. Um, House Bill 1279. Oh, did someone have a question? I heard someone talk. Um, House Bill 1279 is around online sales for retail marijuana. The original version of this bill was pretty murky about whether or not it was allowing online sales and what that would actually look like and would it have impacts to delivery. And through the legislative process, they really kind of cleaned up some of those details. Um, so the bill did pass. It only allows online sale for retail marijuana. Um, they still have to have certain messaging in place, age verification. Um, and then for somebody who actually makes that purchase online, they do have to go and be present in person in a retail space in order to get their product or they'll have, then have to go through all of that age verification again. Um, and it does not look like delivery was included in the final version of this bill that went through. And lastly, a bill that came through since we last spoke was Senate Bill 290. This bill relates to the psychedelics ballot measure from the fall and does some kind of restructuring of the regulatory side of that ballot measure. So the ballot measure passed all the regulation under DORA and had it housed there. This bill restructures that a little bit where the licensing of the workers in the facilities that will be allowed to open through that ballot measure, that will still stay under DORA, um, but the licensing and regulation of the facility itself will now go under Department of Revenue, which aligns a little bit more with other regulatory functions that those agencies have. It's a little bit more akin to marijuana, so it makes a little bit more sense structurally for those regulations. For environmental health and climate change bills, House Bill 1294, uh, this one had a lot of kind of discourse. It was a much anticipated bill. Um, and then not long before I think it was expected to be introduced, Governor Polis introduced his plan around air quality, at which addressed some of the things that were planned to be included in the legislation, but not everything. Um, and so our bill sponsors, I think, reformulated a bit and ultimately released this one or introduced this one in the legislative process. Um, and that did go forward, uh, but that was a little bit of a discourse between the governor's office and the legislature. Um, and then Senate Bill um, 16 that we looked at a few months ago earlier in session um, ultimately went through too. So we did see a number of air, important air quality bills go forward this session. And then for the last couple updates here around our community safety and violence prevention bills, we've talked in our last few updates about the package of four bills related to firearm access and safety. Those ultimately passed and were signed by Governor Polis. Uh, there were a couple other firearm access related bills as well. 1230, which was introduced around the same time as that package, but wasn't included in it, um, ultimately didn't go forward. Um, and then Senate Bill 279 was introduced later, and this one is really geared towards firearms that don't have serial numbers or components that can be constructed and put together to create a firearm that then wouldn't have a serial number, sometimes called ghost guns, and that bill did ultimately go forward and pass. So those are my updates for y'all this month. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, and like I said, I will get you a comprehensive um, summary of what we looked at this session and some of the outcomes as well. So you have that whole picture available to you too.
Thank you, Kelly. Are there questions or comments for Kelly? As we all watch some of these things go through and go through the debates. I appreciate the updates, thanks. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Okay, we have got some new business. Um, we're going to have a presentation. Okay, Watkins on the community health assessment. Kate, we're anxious to hear from you. Good afternoon. Let me figure out how to share my slides. Apologies, sorry. Are you, let's see, you seen uh, notes or the presentation? Notes, notes. Okay. Let's see your notes. <laughs> Sorry, gotta figure out which screen it's gonna connect to. <laughs> Those are notes. still your uh, notes. Still notes? Uh, there you go. There you go. All right. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, every Zoom seems to be different. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kate Watkins. I am the data science and epidemiology uh, supervisor for Jefferson County Public Health. And I'm going to be talking about our final product for our community health assessment, um, our process, and we'll have an ask of you at the end. Uh, in case this is new for you, the purpose of the community health assessment is to provide a comprehensive and broad overview of the population of health in, sorry, the health of the population <laughs> in Jefferson County. Uh, we conduct a community health assessment at least every five years and are on track to publish our next assessment in June or July of this year. Local public health agencies are required to complete a community health assessment by, by both uh, Colorado State statute and the assessment is a cornerstone of the public health accreditation standards. This assessment that will be published this year will meet the standards of both requirements. Uh, for those of you new to the board and as a refresher for those who have heard this before, this assessment process for this particular community health assessment has encountered several challenges over the past few years. And we have adapted each time to meet those challenges and the new ones have come up. We originally intended to maintain our three-year cycle for the community health assessment to align with our hospital partners, which would have resulted in the assessment being published in early 2021. But as you all know, COVID happened. <laughs> and that response took priority in 2020, which pushed this timeline back. We had hoped that we would have the capacity to publish by the end of 2021. However, other priorities, still including COVID, also took precedence. We then decided to partner with an external service who would develop the assessment for us and publish it in June of 2022. However, that service pivoted their business model and severed the contract with us in the spring of 2022, which brings us to our current plan to use our internal JCPH resources to publish by June of this year. Um, the assessment process that we conducted had three main phases, data collection, data interpretation, and the development of the final products. The first phase of the assessment 
process was to collect both primary data and review secondary data indicators. For our primary data collection, we took a unique approach that we were really excited about to highlight our community's voice. We developed a request for proposals from uh, community-based organizations in Jefferson County. And this partnership allowed us to compensate the organizations for their time and participation in collecting community perspectives from the populations they already were connected to. This approach also included funds for the organizations to compensate their community members for their involvement and their knowledge, as well as supports needed to help with the data collection, like childcare, transportation, language justice, uh, among other things. Um, so to do this, we developed new contracts with Jefferson Center, Kaizen, Bondadosa, and Archway, and we utilized an existing contract with the Latinas Community Connection. Each organization could choose how they wanted to engage with their community members and could have included any combination of surveys, focus groups, or semi-structured interviews. But all organizations ask these four core questions. What do you need to be your most happy, healthy, thriving self? What are the characteristics of a happy, healthy, thriving community? What are the three most important health issues facing the communities in Jefferson County in which you live, work, or play? And what resources exist in Jefferson County that can help you to be your most happy, healthy, thriving self? We provided the support tools and trainings for the organizations to conduct this work. And through this work, we were actually able to collect feedback from over 600 community participants which is amazing. That is, I think for the last community health assessment, we had less than 10% of that participation. So the, by far and away, this was a success to do. Um, in addition to hearing what the community's members had to say, we wanted to hear what our JCPH workforce and our elected officials had to say. So our workforce members, play a role in working towards supporting a healthy Jefferson County every day. So regardless of their individual role within the organization, they ha all have valuable perspectives about the status of health in Jefferson County. In addition, we worked with Kelly Curl, who conducted key informant interviews with a sample of local municipal officials to gain their unique perspectives on their community health issues and strengths. So um, in addition to all of the primary data we collected, we also reviewed over 100 secondary data indicators. So this is data that we didn't collect ourselves, but that we can use to look at changes in health trends over time, differences between uh, Jefferson County and Colorado, and identify health topics where differences might occur between demographic groups. The second phase of the assessment was interpreting all of the data we compiled in order to find meaning within it. To support this data interpretation, our team met multiple times with 10 JCPH workforce members representing each division to, who provided insight and content matter, matter expertise on the major topics we saw emerging from our data collection. These conversations included how to incorporate some topics that were more difficult to connect directly to health, but which were mentioned by the community, like cleanliness and trash, as well as topics where the community had diverse opinions, like vaccines, police, and firearms. Um, the work group also helped us finalize the content outline of the assessment, which included organizing the assessment around the social determinants of health, rather than our initial thought, which was to organize it around health behaviors and outcomes. This work group's preferences also, and, and their recommendations also helped guide our decisions regarding our data visualizations and the readability of the assessment. Beyond our workforce members, we also reached back out to 
the Latinas Community Connection for their expertise to discuss the major topics we mentioned or that were mentioned by our Spanish speaking participants. This helped us feel more confident that we were interpreting and representing the concerns of this particular community correctly. The third phase of the assessment was bringing all of this together into our final documents. Um, the data biography is a separate document from the assessment, but provides a comprehensive background on all the data sets utilized in the development of this assessment. Sharing this information is an essential step along the way to us achieving equity in data science. It is intended to be a living document, so as our team continues to work with other data sets, we will continue to add to it and um, expand it as we find more and better data. Um, our team, as is JCPH, values language justice. Uh, for the final report, we applied for and received a grant from the State Health Department that will allow us to translate the assessment into Spanish. And we are being used as kind of a guinea pig because uh, we are the first local public health agency in Colorado to do this. And so the State Health Department is looking to see how well this uh, process goes. So. Hopefully no road bumps. <laughs> uh, in addition to um, in addition to this, we ensured that the document is accessible to as many people as possible. So we have developed it to work with adaptive technology and all charts and visualizations are colorblind friendly. Okay, so for our next steps on May 19th this Friday, we will be sending a final draft of the community health assessment to all Board of Health members to review. Uh, we are requesting that you provide us any questions or feedback to Lindsay Gonzalez by June 9th. Uh, this will allow us to address any questions or concerns you might find with the document and provide follow up during the June 20th Board of Health meeting. At that meeting, we will be asking for your approval to publish the community health assessment. If approved during that meeting, we will be publishing the assessment on June 30th. And we have some wiggle room there if we need to make any corrections between the uh, 20th and the 30th before publication. If it's not approved, uh, we will revise the assessment based on your feedback and then again, request approval to publish at the July 18th Board of Health meeting with the expe expectation that we'll be able to publish then on July 28th. Um, once the assessment has been finalized and approved, we will begin the work on the Spanish translation. Okay, and that is the, it for my presentation. Does anybody have any Questions. Questions, comments from the board. Well, Kate, I think you've been very busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our, our team has spent a lot of time on this over the last year. <laughs> it takes a lot of work, doesn't it? It does, especially to uh, really get that community voice uh, and make sure that we're representing it appropriately in the document. Yeah. Hilda, do you have a comment? Yes, I do. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm really excited to hear, listen to that report. I'm looking forward to see um, what you guys have been collecting and um, see how we're moving forward. Uh, I'm just curious, um, and I you probably mentioned it, but I didn't hear it. Um, is there any plan to go back to the community and uh, report the findings? Yeah, so that part of the process is uh, called the CHIP process, the Community Health Improvement Process. And so that will be the next step in this is taking this data back to the communities and having them prioritize what topics they think that um, we as the local public health agency and our community partners should be focused on for the next five years. 
three to five years, depending <laughs> on what cycle we go with. Um, and in addition, any as we were collecting information from the community, any community members that uh, wanted to see the report, we collected all of their uh, contact information so that we could provide that report to them once it was finalized. So are you going to translate that report? Yes. Yeah. So once the final report has the English version has been approved by the Board of Health next month or in July. Um, once that product has been finalized, then we will start the uh, Spanish translation of the, of the document. Perfect. And do you have you identify other languages other than Spanish or? Unfortunately, at this point in time, the grant we received to uh, translate the document into Spanish is only enough to translate in, into Spanish. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Harriet, there, you have your hand up. So um, you mentioned the, the attempts, and I know this has been true in the past too, to um, coordinate the sequence with the planning processes that the hospitals need to go through um, and the challenges for that. What ultimately happened with the hospital's plans? Um, I assume they're not coordinated, but are they, did they finish theirs or are they still working on them or, you know, what? Yes, I'd have to go back and look at the timelines again for their assessment. So the hospitals have a three-year cycle for their assessments versus ours, which is a five-year cycle. And so we did the last go round managed to align and then COVID messed up that alignment, but we did support them in developing their assessments. Oh, I want to say at the end of 2021, spring of 2022, I think, um, to help but provide didn't data stop with them. Theirs. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. They, they were able to move ahead. Okay. Yes, they mm -hmm. were. Um, and so if there is a possibility for the next go round for us to align again with them. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Kate? Okay, well, Kate, thank you. And thank you yes. for the long hard work that you have been putting into this. Yes. It'll be thank nice you for you to have the, the finished product, I know. Yes, yes. it'll be very nice to check that off. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Okay, moving right into the very next portion that everyone is just uh, very excited about. Not that we aren't excited about all the other presentations that we've had, but I know this has been a long time coming. Um, we would like to introduce to you uh, JCPH's Interim Executive Director, um, Jeff Zayek. And I have to tell you, we you know, I don't have to tell any of you that are signed on what the process has been like. It's been quite quite the lengthy process. And so we're really, really happy to have Jeff on board. I am not going to try and go through all of his um, experience and, and what he can bring to the table because I'm going to ask him to do that. But uh, I know that you've had a chance, Jeff, to meet with uh, the senior leadership team. And I know the staff is very much looking forward um, to meeting you as well. And if you have not marked your calendars, please do. Uh, we are actually having a meet and greet um, so that everyone can um, meet Jeff. And it's going to be uh, June 7th, uh, 12 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. And it will be at the Parfit um, building in the Longs Peak Conference Room. And Lindsay has assured me that she's got the snacks covered. So we want okay. everyone to come so that you all can meet Jeff. And with that, I'm going to have um, go right into the very next portion when we're going to hear from the senior leadership team updates. And Jeff, ask you to speak first, and please do introduce yourself. Um, I would bundle it terribly if I tried to talk about everything that you've done. Oh, no worries. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the board members uh, for giving me the opportunity, my, my passion, and my commitment to work uh, over my life in the past 33 years has been to public health. And it's what, the reason I got into it is because my values align with the values of public health. And I'm appreciative of your opportunity 
here to provide me a continuation of working with public health to help support the organization moving forward. Um, but to sum it up, I've been, I've got about 33 years of experience in public health, 12 of those years up until April of 2001 was as executive director of Boulder County Public Health, which is actually very similar in terms of budget and staffing, even though our populations differ a little bit. Jeffco's is a bit larger. Um, and I have worked in, I think, as you all know now, all the areas uh, in Boulder County Public Health as you cover in Jeffco um, and have had experiences in those areas and, and can come in, I believe, and help support the organization until you get uh, to the next executive director as you move, you're moving forward in the organization. And I would be remiss um, if I didn't just take a second here to say thank you to each of you as Board of Health members, to the staff of Jeffco, and especially um, to the senior leadership team, who I know for the last 14 months have been working really hard uh, to keep the organization moving forward and running. And uh, from what I can tell, they've done an incredible job doing that. Uh, and I am absolutely excited um, and motivated to continue to help support them until you get a new executive director. Some of the things I'm working on right now, just so everyone knows is, and that I've done in the past since I left Boulder County is I've been helping Broomfield County Public Health support the implementation of a health equity plan within their organization. I was liaison between all the public health directors um, in the state and Jill Huntsaker, who's the executive director of uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, I also am currently working with Illuminate to help support the implementation of a metro-wide early childhood program um, and am doing a little bit of strategic advising with Boulder County Public Health. So um, it feels really good because I feel like I'm still able to help people in these spaces that they're in. And I certainly look forward to working with all the staff and the senior leadership team at Jeffco. So thank you again for this opportunity and look forward to talking with you all more in the future. Thank you, Jeff. And um, so that's what happens when you retire, you know. <laughs> you, you never really retire when you're in, you know, so used to working with community because they just won't let you go. Well, thank you. And um, does anyone have any questions for, for Jeff? I know that um, one of the things that impressed us greatly was the fact that he was so excited to work with the senior leadership team who have put in incredible amount of time to do the great job that they've done over the last 14 months and the board can't thank them enough. Um, and it'll be nice now to have Jeff who can, you know, help with some of the stuff that the senior leadership team asks for. And um, we've got a good, strong team, and this staff is the best, of course, we know in Jefferson County. Okay, if there's no questions or comments for Jeff, um, Jody, you're the deputy director here. Would you please make some comments? Thank you, Sherry. Welcome, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon, everybody else. Just a quick update on what's going on in our clinic. I know I haven't talked about that in quite some time, so I thought it would be really timely to let you know, um, I guess, kind of some updates. We, clinic, we currently do not have a clinic director. Um, we did a couple of recruitments. Um, you may remember Kelly Conroy, she left just over a year ago. And so we had an interim director, Gwen, for about eight months, eight to nine months. Uh, she recently moved on to Adams County Public, or, or yeah, Adams County Public Health. Um, and we, we felt like it was a really good time with that turnover, uh, not just those two, but many supervisors. We have three of the four supervisors in the clinic are brand new. And so, uh, several of them have been coming to us over the last uh, several months and saying, you know, maybe it's time to look at how we do everything that we do. And so we started a process with the Atawi group, who you all are familiar with, to really dig deep into our um, family planning um, program. So we have uh, three primary, I guess, programs in the clinic. We have family planning, immunizations, and our harm reduction team. So we're starting with family planning and just doing a deep dive into um, what clients we see. Um, other, we have some clients in Jefferson County who used to come to us. Now they go to other places, uh, some Denver, some other surrounding counties. Um, just so looking at all of our numbers, all of our budget, all of our costs, um, really everything in the family planning clinic. We know some of that's going to overlap with the other programs in the clinic. Um, but again, with the, the family planning um, side, especially just had an immense amount of change. 
And so post COVID again with a new supervisor um, and a lot of change in the staff, a lot of cuts, honestly, last year with the budget um, to our clinic services, um, grants that constantly change, um, that go up, that go down over the course of the years um, from federal funding, uh, state funding and things like that. So we're, we're taking a, a very deep dive into the clinic and we just really thought timing wise, it's a really good opportunity to have this data um, available for a new director um, so that to help them make some decisions also to work with Jeff. So timing wise, I'm really good to have Jeff on board to help us with some of the immediate decisions that have to be made before we get uh, the next director. We do have to renew some kind of an agreement with a uh, chief medical officer um, by the end of June, uh, Dr. Con Johnson's contract uh, ends. So we wanna make sure that we're kind of looking at what the, the next steps are with that. Uh, we feel like even if a new director wants to come in and make major changes based on the data that we're gathering, um, that with the grants that we have, the funding streams that we have, um, clients and everything, that it's going to take at least a year probably to really um, make major changes anyway. So I'm looking to sign a, a next contract with a next medical officer that could be up to a year, um, but may also consider six months. We just keep kind of trying to extend um, with Dr. Johnson and uh, very much appreciate him doing that. So haven't spoken with him yet or, or some other alternatives yet, um, but we're going to be jumping on that process here very quickly. And so look forward to having those conversations um, with Jeff as well. So um, if you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to try to answer them. But again, with without having a director there right now, Christine Billings and I are supporting uh, those teams. And so if there's anything that you would typically work with the clinic director on, please reach out to one of us. And if we can't answer your question, we'll connect you with the right folks. Um, but we're also facilitating this, this process with Atawi. So um, getting to know the clinic very well, getting to know the staff really well. It's, a, again, a fantastic team there. And just, uh, I know for me, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to learn about everything they're doing. Thank you. Joe? <laughs> you know, a lot of people say my name that way. Uh, hello again, everyone. The update I have from an administrative services doesn't really reflect uh, what you typically hear from admin. Um, the health department, JCPH, um, will soon have a fully functional mobile clinic. Um, we have gone through a very long, extenuous process, a very collaborative process to get a to purchase a vehicle, a van, uh, that uh, to utilize. I think funding that was available. Um, I forget what year it's been so long. Twenty twenty one funding that was available. We purchased a van, and then shortly thereafter, we moved it to um, customizing the the um, to outfitting the van to see patients and to provide a mobile clinic. Um, we, um, we, we've, we've been working with fleet services. We've been working with clinic staff. Um, this really was the brainchild from Salma, um, our accounting supervisor. Um, she put everything in motion uh, quite some time ago. We had the van. Um, I believe we purchased the van, finally moved forward with purchasing in July of last year, then moved it to customizing the van. Uh, outfitting it for our needs. Um, there was a lot of delays involved with that, but thanks to a lot of staff members, Max Johnson in the clinic um, and various other clinic staff members, admin staff members, we have, we received the van last, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. However, due to the long delay, there's been some uh, searching for the title of the van. Thanks to Lindsay uh, coming through at the, the, the final hour and working with the DMV, we, we were able to get a replacement uh, title. So uh, many thanks to her, to many staff members, but uh, very soon, hopefully, we will have a license plate on the vehicle. We will have insurance on the vehicle, and it will hopefully be able to leave our parking lot. The reason why I bring this up is not only to highlight the collaborative approach, the exciting news that we have a mobile clinic, but hopefully to set the, to the tone for future updates from our clinic to see you know, what they will be using this van for. And hopefully they'll be providing some very exciting news for us um, here in the coming months. But also, if any of the board members do find themselves in the Parfait building, please take a moment to go look at the van because it was a lot of work getting it up and running and getting it mobile. Um, I hope there's still gas in the unit because I hope it leaves our parking lot very, very soon. Um, that, that's all I have for today. Thank you, everyone.
I think that's exciting. And I know it was a long process. So thank you for hanging in there with that. Any questions or comments for Joe? Okay. Jim. Jim Rada, you're up. Good afternoon, all. Um, I have a couple of things to share with you all today. Um, I see on the screen a Jody with an I. Jody, are you on there? And can you um, turn on your camera? I just want to introduce some new staff that we've uh, brought on board, and that she might be too shy to do that. So I'll just go ahead and introduce uh, Jody Jackson, who just became Jody Jackson. Um, she joined our team as Jody Zimmerman and has since become a married woman. And so we're very happy for her and her life change, um, as well as very happy for bringing her on board. Uh, Jody comes to us with over 10 years of environmental health practice experience. And so it brings, she brings great knowledge and experience to us. And uh, we're really looking forward to have her working with us uh, early on in the retail food inspection program, but she also has very strong experience and leadership in the nationally in the body art program. So, and our body art program has grown, uh, it's more than doubled in the time that I've been with Jefferson County. So um, it's great to have Jody on board. Um, we have also brought on Jeanette Mays. Jeanette joins us with many years experience uh, from the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment, mm -hmm. uh, where she was most recently an air quality specialist. So Je Jody, bring, or I mean, sorry, Jeanette brings with us or to us um, uh, the uh, immediate uh, 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 ability to address our contractual needs. Uh, with CDPHE and help us get our inspection workload accomplished, um, uh, definitely accomplished this year. So we're really happy to have Jeanette on board. And as I do, as we do with all of our new inspectors, we we um, get them started on in whatever makes the most sense. But we offer lots of opportunity for growth and development into many different, as many different environmental health areas as possible. Um, we will hopefully be fully staffed by the middle part of June, finally, uh, or July. Um, we are bringing one more person on board in June and another in July, so that will bring the environmental health team back to full strength. Um, we're very pleased to know that, and hopefully we'll be uh, um, back to full strength in our programs uh, very soon, too. Um, I also today, uh, I'd like to really begin a, a a series of brief updates to the board um, regarding recent rulemaking uh, hearings of the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission. Uh, CDPHE and the Air Quality Control Commission have begun an aggressive rulemaking agenda that spun out of the 2021 legislative session. Um, Assistant County Attorney Kathy Parker and I have joined a local uh, government coalition representing Jefferson County Public Health as a party to the first two of these formal rulemaking actions. And today I wanna to just give you a brief uh, overview of um, the most recent rulemaking in April, and then just kind of give you a heads up. And then in subsequent months, I will update you on the outcomes of additional air quality hearings um, that are taking place, rulemaking hearings. So last month, the Air Quality Control Commission adopted new measures connected to Regulation 20 that increases the availability of zero emission trucks uh, that offer lower operating and fuel costs. This uh, regulation review went through a very long stakeholdering process and, and then the, an extensive rulemaking uh, process. If anyone has ever been involved with a state Health Department rulemaking process, at least in the environmental side of things, um, it is extensive and there's a lot of, of interaction between all of the parties that participate in the rulemaking process. So it was an interesting um, rulemaking. These new measures that the commission um, adopted give Colorado businesses and consumers more options when buying zero emission trucks. They reduce uh, maintenance, operating, and fuel costs for zero emission truck owners. Uh, they dramatically reduce 
greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide that cause climate change. Um, they reduce air pollution emissions like nit nitrogen oxides and particulate matter that lead to the formation of harmful ground level ozone pollution. Uh, the air quality benefits are particularly important uh, for further protecting Colorado's, Coloradans living in communities disproportionately impacted by pollution. Many of these communities are located along heavy traffic corridors in and around the commercial and industrial areas of the state. The, uh, the Air Quality Control Commission unanimously approved three rules. Uh, I sat in on a good portion of the hearing. It was very long and very intense. Uh, the Advanced Clean Trucks rule uh, sets a sales standard for manufacturers to make more zero emission trucks available in Colorado. Uh, it takes effect for trucks starting with the model year 2027 and sales standard Per, um, percentages grow incrementally through the year 2035. So over the next decade or more, uh, there will be more vehicles available. This rule requires manufacturers and um, distributors to make these vehicles more available. Uh, the rule only applies to manufacturers of medium and heavy duty trucks. So we're talking anything from a, probably a large box van to a semi trailer truck. And it doesn't impact farming equipment or off-road construction equipment. Um, the sales standard does not require businesses or consumers to buy these vehicles. It just makes them more readily available. And I think there's more incentives that will be available for to encourage people to purchase. There's another rule that was passed that was called the Low Knox Truck Rule, and this sets more stringent air pollution emission standards for heavy-duty vehicles improves the testing requirements for engine and extends the warranties on these engines. A lot of technical details, but it, it, it takes a effect uh, for trucks starting with the model year of 2027. Um, NOx is a primary uh, uh, constituent of the formation of ground level ozone. So by removing NOx or nitrogen oxides from the emissions of these trucks, we really um, do a lot to remove the the precursors of ozone so that we create less ozone in the long run. Um, most trucks run on diesel, uh, which generates even more NOx <laughs> emissions in the vehicle than vehicles that run on gas. So this will really help. And I think they're saying that the, the rule will lower the nitrogen oxide emission standard for new vehicles by 90% compared to what the current standard is. So that's a really important one when we talk about uh, ozone um, precursors and the creation of ozone during an ozone season. <clears throat> uh, the commission also made some changes to the division's proposal for the last rule, which is the large entity reporting rules. Um, this will uh, require um, operators with fleets of more than 20 um, or more trucks uh, to provide specific information to the state, um, the re first reporting deadline being November 30th of 2024, and then there'll be a second one. That's where there was a lot of debate, should there be more than one reporting period? But the commission did agree to a second reporting period that would end on December 31st of 2027. Uh, the Environmental Justice Coalition, which was another party to the process, suggested that the division will also make all of this data publicly available. And I think the, the commission agrees with that idea. Um, so a lot of the work that went into this is really aimed at reducing greenhouse gas pollution and also reducing the precursors of ozone. There, um, the air division, the air pollution control division at CDPHE completed an economic analysis as a part of this process. Uh, that shows that a total savings could be more than $15 billion uh, through 2050. And it really, um, it, it really goes, this, this rule really helps in terms of um, reducing the amount of, of maintenance and fuel that owners of these vehicles, but it also more, and probably, and more importantly, uh, offers savings through avoided health impacts and avoided climate impacts from the large fleet of heavy and me medium duty trucks that are in our 
uh, metropolitan area. So there are a couple of new grants uh, programs that have opened for um, companies that own these types of vehicles, uh, two grant programs um, to fund for uh, cleaner vehicles for these fleets. Uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act created significant incentives for emission, uh, low or zero emission trucks. Uh, these include up to $40,000 off the purchase price of clean trucks through a new federal tax credit. Uh, Colorado is also positioned to access significant federal funding to assist in the deployment and reduce upfront costs of zero emission trucks. That is a lot to say about one regulation. Um, it was a long uh, hearing process, long rulemaking process. This week, the Colorado Depart uh, Air Pollution Control Division is presenting another rule, proposed rule, uh, for adoption by the Air Quality Control Commission, uh, which is a res in response to Colorado's Environmental Justice Act that was signed by Governor Polis back in July of 2021. Um, that hearing started today and will go through Friday. Um, I intend to uh, follow that one closely as we are part of the local government coalition um, that is a party to this rulemaking. Um, I will. Um, uh, enjoy um, sharing with you the outcomes next month. Um, and But the purpose of this rule is really to uh, consider new or additional permitting uh, modeling and or monitoring requirements for new or modified sources of pollution. Uh, these sources could be manufacturing sources, oil and gas, construction, all of which affect disproportionately impacted communities. And again, the focus of this Regulation 3 is really um, on trying in response to the Colorado Environmental Justice Act. So the focus is on really addressing pollution issues within our disproportionately impacted communities in Colorado. Um, so I'll give you a little more information on that. There's a couple more coming up later this summer, Regulation 28, which is a uh, related to climate change and addressing the, uh, o the greenhouse gas uh, um, roadmap um and then there will on um, that's the uh, actually reg 28 is about um, energy performance standards for buildings to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from large buildings in our in our metropolitan area well in all across the state and then in uh, later in the summer is uh, uh, another one uh, it's called gem 2 gem is Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Energy Management for Manufacturing. And this is phase two of the GEM program. And this will put um, greater controls on greenhouse gas emissions from large manufacturing and industrial operations across the state. And the reason I bring that one right up now is because it there are three facilities that are being um, looked at in Jefferson County that could potentially be impacted by this. Um, Golden Aluminum uh, Incorporated, Molson Coors in Golden, and Rocky Mountain Bottle Company, I believe they're in Golden also. Um, but the, these are three large manufacturing operations that emit many, many thousands of tons of greenhouse gases every year um, that will be uh, potentially impacted by this rulemaking. And that should take place sometime later. I believe it's September or August of this year. Anyway, that was a long-winded uh, update, but I wanted you all to be um, become or start becoming familiar with some of the actions that are going on as air quality is a, is a, a substantial issue in Jefferson County. Um, we still have the highest ozone levels uh, recorded in the uh, non-attainment area of the state. Um, there's a lot of effort underway by the state government, um, as well as many, many, many entities across the North Denver uh, Metro Front Range um, um, non-attainment area, um, trying to address and tackle these, these issues. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to make any connections or, or link you to any of this information. Uh, feel free to send me a message if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was a lot of work. A lot of meetings you went to. 
Okay, Christine. Christine Hello, there you are. Here. Excuse my wear. We are in the middle of graduation season in my house, but I'm happy to hop on and update all of you. Um, so a few updates for my team. Uh, biggest, which you've probably seen in the news, is on May 11th, the public health emergency for COVID-19 uh, was ended uh, at both the federal level and the state level. So um, I know I've spoke to it before, but the team is working to um, wholeheartedly shift into recovery mode um, and what that means. So we will be, um, our data website for COVID-19 uh, is currently uh, in the process of being archived. So all of that data will continue to be available for the next year, but it is no longer going to be updated. Um, there was no significant shift in data between April and May, and with the end of the public health emergency, it was determined that it is the appropriate time to sunset that particular update. Um, with that comes a project that is being done within um, Kate Watkins Data Science and Epidemiology team uh, to look at other ways that we can display all of our infectious disease data on the website in a data dashboard format. Um, so they are working with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists on a um, free to us a pilot project to determine what is the best way to display our infectious disease data, simultaneously working on a surveillance project so that we can be forward leaning for the next respiratory virus or any other infectious disease emergency that will be coming our way. Hopefully not for a while, um, but they are leaning forward into that as well. So we are very excited about that. Um, we, even though the public health emergency has ended, uh, Jefferson County Public Health will continue access at a low level to um, free COVID-19 tests. So with the end of the public health emergency, access to free testing has ended. Um, but we are maintaining, at least through the April of 2024, uh, access to free tests. And once that um, program's information is ready to be published, we will put that up on the JCPH website. Uh, we are working very closely with our partners at the Latinas Community Connection, and they are helping support access and outreach to um, tests that are actually available in four different languages uh, to members of our community. Uh, in fact, I had a team member out there this morning uh, doing a presentation and a meeting with them on site. So we are very excited about that continued collaboration for the next um, almost year with that particular group. Other activities going on, our health communications team is in the process of um, reading and reviewing the community health assessment. Uh, so tying together your full meeting today. <laughs> so that is ongoing. And our emergency preparedness team uh, through the Healthcare Coalition recently supported a water disruption tabletop exercise with our health and medical partners uh, across the region. And that was it was really, really interesting. There is a lot of significant impact to dialysis centers, long-term care facilities, hospitals, when water is disrupted, uh, which leads me to my next update. Um, at the federal level, they are adding preparedness capabilities. We have 15 preparedness capabilities that our preparedness team works on um, and works to be best at. They are adding one related to the impacts of climate change. So we are completely integrating into Jim's division um, in terms of knowledge and expertise and working on an environmental health response plan that will have climate change impacts. Um, so we are really crossing boundaries and blowing down silos and doing all of the work that should be done um, as we move forward. So we're excited to see more from the from our federal partners to see what is involved in that capability, but we're we're ahead of the curve in terms of getting our environmental emergency preparedness response plans in place um, with tabletop exercises to come. And then the final update I have is that our employee of the month for this year came from my division. Um, he is not on today. He is uh, undergoing a significant life event um, with a huge congratulations involved. So nothing bad, but a huge shout out to 
Nick Adams, who is one of our preparedness planners. Um, he is our employee of the month for May. Uh, and some of the uh, comments from his supervisor, Anjanette Hawkins, spoke to um, Nick merging in with our preparedness team to help us move out of the uh, preparedness of space that we had in the Dakota building over into the Parfait building. He came in and completely inventoried all of our um, stuff and personnel so that we can track everybody if we need to deploy and everything. So he has established a inventory tracking system for us. Um, he is brand new to public health, which is very exciting that we have, um, as I like to say, sucked someone into the world of public health. Uh, so he is new to his role at public health. He's actively learning and engaging in all of the activities that we do as a preparedness team. Um, and Anjanette said that Nick's dedication, enthusiasm, and personality make him an empl amazing employee and a collaborative colleague to work with. His attitude is contagious, and we are incredibly grateful and honored to have him as a team member. So congratulations to Nick, um, both for your life event today and uh, for being employee of the month. That's all I have. Well, I'd say that's quite a list. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. Okay. Were there any questions? Um, I see, Harriet, that I think you're talking. Are you, did you have a question? You're on mute. You're still on mute. There you are. I'm off mute. Um, yeah, my, so um, I have heard, um, so I'll go, going back to, going back to COVID, sorry. Um, but I've heard that um, while much of the data collection, et cetera, ended with the emergency that there are still some things going on. Um, I've heard this like on a national level. Um, I heard this on, I think probably on NPR, um, like um, the wastewater um, surveillance will be done and all of that. So are we doing any of that or is that done um, elsewhere? And if the data is being archived, how does the public who have concerns still, um, which I know um, many of the people in my generation do um, and want to kind of track the things that can still be tracked, um, how, how does the public um, find that out? <clears throat> yeah, Harriet, great question. Thank you. So speaking to your last question about where the public can continue to find data, one of the processes that we will have is to make sure that links to the state health department that are clear and accessible will be available. So CDPHE will be continuing to track data and update that um, on a regular basis on their website. So Jefferson County data will be available on the CDPHE website. So that will continue on. Um, we will continue to have access to our data questionnaire on the JCPH website. So as always, um, requests for data can be submitted through the, the health department's website. Again, to your point of someone looking to find um, active information, CDPHE will be the best spot. One of the problems and why we are sort of archiving the data in its space speaks to your first point about some data requirements ending and some continuing. Um, one of the pieces that are ending is the requirement to report positive tests of COVID-19. Um, there are still caveats within the state of Colorado. So hospitalized cases and cases that um, are tested by the, the PCR process. So the actual nasal swab that is run to the lab, those will continue to be required to be reported but every other type of test, um, it's on individuals if they test positive to take the steps needed to prevent spread of the disease within their, their circle. So continue those 10 days of isolation with the, the masking in place um, as well. So uh, that will be ongoing, um, but that's why we're no longer, the, the data requirement for reporting is just, has ended. And so what we would be sharing is only just the tiniest snapshot and not really what we need. Now, now to show the impact of COVID-19, it's really who's being hospitalized because that speaks to the severity of the illness. Um, you know, 
we're hoping we haven't seen it yet, but the the ideal scenario is that COVID-19 moves into a respiratory pattern very similar to influenza. Um, we haven't seen that yet. We have seen uh, peaks happen in July for the last two years. So we're um, cautiously waiting for the, you know, the midsummer peak to arrive. It, if it arrives, we have not reached seasonality. If it doesn't, then we'll see what happens come early October if we start to see an, an, a rise in cases uh, similar to when we start to see influenza cases occur. That being said, JCPH is continuing to have conversations with those who we um, are identified to us as testing positive, not in terms of uh, an information gathering piece, um, but in terms of supporting access to resources and information and making sure that our community members have uh, what they need to feel confident in their ability to manage COVID-19 on their own. Um, so part of our recovery work as well is, um, to, to your point, to circle back around Harriet, is that we are working um, on a, <laughs> a how-to COVID guide. So for the community, how do you do COVID? Um, because COVID is not going away. And so we want to arm our community with information on how do you do COVID without all of the resources from the federal government and without all the resources from the state health department, without as many resources from your local health department, how do you do that? Um, and we are excited to have a student that is going to help us this summer um, also uh, work with our Latinx community to make a culturally appropriate version of that how to COVID guide as well. Thank you, Christine. Okay, we have one more, um, last but certainly not least, Alex, uh, with the Family Services. She is our director. Alex, do you have an update for us? I do. Um, hopefully two short updates. First, I want to say thank you to Lane for attending the kickoff for the Bright Futures Roadmap last week. Um, I think we there was over 50 plus partners in the room um, reinvigorating uh, the Bright Futures Roadmap. And I will make sure to share through Lindsay opportunities for um, the board to participate and engage um, as that work moves forward. Um, and second, I also want to recognize Claudia Benavides, who is our bilingual family navigation coordinator, who's been nominated for a Children's Champion Award through the Triad Early Childhood Council. Wow. She was nominated by her supervisor, Mary Margaret Faust Bishop, as well as a community partner um, for her commitment to work as a family navigator in Jefferson County. She's been leaning into her potential as a leader in this navigation work and has stretched herself to be a consistent presence in the community, attending community partner events, as well as taking on leadership responsibilities within the Jeffco Home Visitation Collaborative, which is a group of representatives from early childhood home visitation programs across the county. Claudia has a heart for people and demonstrates her care through her consistent follow-up with clients, often going above and beyond to meet families where they are and connecting them to what they need to thrive. Claudia has received positive accolades from community partners, colleagues, and clients alike. And when a community evaluation was conducted in 2022 of the Jeffco Family Navigator Services, clients and community partners across the board had positive responses about the integral role Claudia plays in the community. So we are really excited to be celebrating Claudia at the annual Children's Champion Awards breakfast on June 6th. So that's it for me. That's very exciting. Claudia, way to go. You ought to be very, very proud. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from anything, any one of the staff so far? Hey, why don't we move, I mean, not the staff from all the uh, leadership team, uh, staff comments. Do we have anyone from the staff that would like to make a comment? We really appreciate you all signing in every week and we like hearing from you. So if you have ideas or thoughts, whatever, you can always email Lindsay and she makes sure that we get them. Okay, I don't see any hands going up. Uh, Board of Health comments. 
Who would like to be first? Who has a comment? Going, going, Lane. Uh, well, welcome to all those new folks. And, uh, and yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to join Alex and many of her team. That's uh, a, another just example of great partnerships and efforts in our community. I continue to be impressed and, and really very excited for the opportunities and the, the direction that things are going in Jeffco. Um, so again, great opportunities. And, and I think look forward to hearing more updates to Alex from folks participating in that in a lot more in depth than, than I probably will have time to do as, or even expertise to do. So, um, but again, just appreciate everyone. And, and again, the accolades uh, are well-deserved. So it's not surprising to hear these things, but it's still wonderful to hear. Harriet. So um, I asked my question about the end, the public, end of the public health emergency, but I also think that we ought to make that a time for thank yous over for the very, very, very hard work and situation, difficult situations, plural, that um, many, 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 many of the folks that um, the health department have had over the course of the pandemic and just, um, you know, I mean, I know that that um, <clears throat> that it's been tough all around and um, thank you, you are appreciated. And celebrate the end, <laughs> even yeah. though we know it's not yeah. the end of COVID, it is the end of the emergency. Yeah. Okay, um, I have just one quick comment besides the fact that I agree with everything that my two colleagues have said, Lane and, and um, Harriet, and I really apologize, apologize, Alex, I was double scheduled that day and I just could not get there, but Lane, I am so happy that you went. Um, and we do want to hear when you have these kinds of things so for all the staff, if you, and the directors, if you have um, things that you think we should, we should go to. Uh, the one thing that I want to remind everyone of is don't forget, we have the employee of the month luncheon. If you've not um, gone to one of those, work hard, get the employee of the month because they're awesome at the 240 Union and the food is just delicious. It will be the 23rd of May. So it's coming up. So thank you. Bring all of your employee of the month. Oh, and I will say, so the board knows too, we are all caught up. You know, we went back to where um, everything kind of shut down with, you know, that awful COVID thing. And so we actually took all of those employee of the months. We added them um, each year, the January uh, 2020, I believe it started, Lindsay. And then we got them all caught up. So everyone has been recognized at the employee of the month luncheon. Any other comments, questions? Well, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, if there's nothing more before us and no one has any other um, questions or comments, we will go ahead and adjourn it. It is 5.27 p.m. Thank you all. Have Thank a great you. rest of the week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.